it sounds frankly like a nightmare uh, a group of extremists bent on atrocities is now openly and officially targeting Christians in Iraq what's going on this is truly a living nightmare that's not going away uh, Christianity in Mosul is dead and a Christian Holocaust is in our midst seven weeks ago we went to Washington DC and we actually were calling this a Christian genocide and since then day by day it's getting worse and worse. More children are being beheaded. Mothers are being raped and killed. The fathers are being hung. But right now, uh, 300,000 Christians are in Iraq fleeing, living in neighboring cities, just wanting a chance not just to survive, but to live. I, I, I want to go back, forgive me for interrupting, I want to go back to presence. something you said because uh, the atrocities committed by ISIS are well known, but still you're, you're, you're startling me with the severity of what you're describing. You say they are beheading children? They are systematically beheading children and mothers and fathers. The world hasn't seen uh, an evil like this for generations. Uh, there's actually a park in Mosul that they've actually beheaded children and put their heads on a stick and they have them in the park. This is crimes against humanity. But ISIS doesn't care because they have a kind of apoc apocalyptic view of what they are doing. They truly believe that the end times are here, that they are part of a cosmic struggle between good and evil, and they're the good guys. This is arguably the most successful terrorist group in history in terms of recruitment and, and land that it controls. Uh, but their worldview is that they are leading the fight to bring true Islam to the Muslim world. This is crimes against humanity, and they're the, doing the most horrendous, the most heartbreaking, crimes you could think of. 50%. Now, I, I want to ask you specifically about what happened in Mosul, because uh, it was widely reported that when ISIS took control of Mosul, which, depending on how you do the numbers, is the second largest city in Iraq, they gave Christians an ultimatum, which would be to convert to Islam, to pay a fine, or, in, in their phrase, death by the sword. It's very clear um, they are killing people, but are, are Christians managing to escape by, by paying a fine? Are, are the ones who cooperate at least assured of any safety? Sure. So the letter that they sent out with those three items, uh, they did ask to pay a fine, but they're actually, after they pay a fine, they're actually taking uh, over their, their wives and their daughters and making them into their wives. So really it's convert or die. Uh, face death by the sword. All Christians, 95% of all Christians in Mosul have fled, and 5% have converted. They've marked the, the red death stamp of ISIS on Christian homes and basically saying, we know who you are, and if you come back, uh, you will get killed. Uh, this is almost, I'm going to ask you, forgive me for interrupting, this is almost a, 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 a kind of a plague out of biblical times. They're literally marking the doors of Christian homes? They are, and with the new story, with the with the letter N, to mark them as Christians, and uh, that's why we're saying this is a Christian Holocaust within our midst, and the world community cannot turn a blind eye on something so uh, tragic. So, so much of crimes are coming out. Children are being beheaded. Folks are being killed just because they're being Christian. And it's happening right now. Once again, acknowledging the atrocities of the crimes that have been committed by ISIS. Genocide is a very powerful word. Do you literally think that ISIS is trying to kill all of the Christians who fall in its hands? They're absolutely killing every Christian they see. This is a genocide in every sense of the word. And they want everyone to convert and they want Sharia law to be the law of the land. And we're talking about a place where Christianity was founded over 1800 years ago. They bombed the church uh, last week. That was 1800 year old church. And they're systematically destroying churches. They've already bombed six churches in the area. And, and no one stopped them. Mark Arabo, speaking on behalf of the Christians of Iraq. Thanks so much for talking to us. Okay, with your expertise and experience, why do they go after the Christians? Well, look, in addition to fighting sort of a military campaign, ISIS has a really apocalyptic view of things. I mean, they, they look at this as the end of times. And uh, so this is not just a battle. They're not just carving out a territory. The world is effectively coming to an end. Islam is going to triumph, and everybody else is going to be annihilated. So when you really get down to the core of it, that's, that's actually the way they think. Um, we do know the gunman, by the way, 
is 20 years old, was 20 years old. Uh, uh, they say he was a student. Um, and allegedly, David, he went around asking other students about their religion. What religion are you? Did, is that being confirmed at all? Well, let me tell you, we have a text from allegedly one of the students who was in the room at the time, and it reads as follows. The shooter was lining people up and asking if they were Christian. If they said yes, then they were shot in the head. If they said no or didn't answer, they were shot in the legs. And this person goes on to say that uh, she was in the room, uh, and anyway, she escaped being shot at all. But if this is true, Bill, I mean, it, it, it just adds a... I don't know how it gets worse than 13 students dead. Well, actually, it's 12 students and one faculty member confirmed dead. Uh, I don't know how it gets any worse unless you hear, you know, this kind of a motive ascribed to it. It just yeah. We might we might also mention, David, that our latest numbers are seven dead, um, ten dead uh, now. It changes every hour on the hour. Uh, now it's ten dead and uh, a number 13 or 14 wounded. Um, I think 13 is a good number, Bill. 13 dead is, okay, 13 yeah. dead. Yeah. Whatever it is, whatever it is, um, the situation in your community, as I mentioned, I've been there. This is so stunning because Roseburg is a peaceful place, is it not? Oh, Bill, Roseburg is an ideal community for families. You know, it's a small community based on a timber and an agriculture economy. We have a burgeoning wine industry here. I mean, this is a place that people want to retire to. We've got a VA medical center, so we've got a lot of veterans that come here. This is a wonderful, scenic part of the country, you know, and you've been here, so you know this. Yes, but it, it's and, and there is the gun culture, as I mentioned, but it's recreational hunting, and you need protection in rural areas like that. Finally, uh, we're hearing that the college itself debated having uh, armed security guards on campus, but they did not have them. Is that true? Have you been able to confirm that? Well, I think there was one uh, security guard today. Uh, I talked to the last the president, the, uh, the most recent president. He's not here anymore, but Joe Olson, who was president for the last several years. I talked to him at his home in Boston today, and he said, you know, David, it's not true. They're saying it's a gun-free zone, that campus. It's not a gun-free zone. And even our attorney general, uh, who shouldn't understand the laws of the state of Oregon, doesn't seem to understand this concept. But I will tell you, today, the college president, the new president, uh, came out and, and announced that from this day forward it will be gun-free zone. But, Bill, as you said at the introduction to your show, tomorrow isn't going to be any different than today. This gun-free zone status, if it had been signs every 10 feet, wouldn't have prevented this madman. That's right. If you're going to, if you want to get a gun and you're an insane killer, you will get a gun, whether it's America or Norway or wherever. Hey, David, we really appreciate it. I know you've been working hard all day. You've done an excellent job, and thanks again. The church in America is going to suffer so terribly. And we laugh now, but they will come after us. And they will come after our children. They will close the net around us while we are playing soccer mom and soccer dad. While we are arguing over so many little things and mesmerized by so many trinkets. The net even now is closing around you and your children and your grandchildren. And it does not cause you to fear. You will be isolated from society as has already happened. Anyone who tries to run for office who actually believes the Bible will be considered a lunatic until finally we are silenced. We will be called things that we're not and persecuted not for being followers of Christ but for being radical fundamentalists who do not know the true way of Christ which of course is love and tolerance. You'll go down as the greatest bigots and haters of mankind in history. They've already come after your children, and for most of you, they got them. You got them through the public schools and indoctrination and the university and indoctrination, and then you wonder why your children come out not serving the Lord. It's because you fed them right into the devil's mouth. So little by little, the net is closing around, and then it's not little by little. Look how fast things are going downhill just in a matter of weeks. A matter of weeks. But at the same time, know this, persecution is always meant for evil, but God always means it for good. And is it not better to suffer in this life, to have an extra weight of glory in heaven? You must settle this in your mind. This is the one thing I want to say over and over. 
do not believe. Down through history, you have a wrong idea of martyrdom and persecution. You think that these men were persecuted and martyred for their sincere faith in Jesus Christ. That was the real reason, but no one heard that publicly. They were martyred and they were persecuted as enemies of the state, as child molesters, as bigots, as narrow-minded, stupid people who had fallen for a ruse and can contribute nothing to society. Your suffering will not be noble. So your mind must be filled with the Word of God when all people persecute you and turn on you. And if the Spirit of God in common grace pulls back and you see even your children and your grandchildren tossing in the lot that you should die. This is no game. You want revival and awakening, but know this. For the most part, great awakenings have come only preceding great national catastrophes or the persecution of the church. I believe God is bringing a great awakening, but I believe that He is raising up young men who are strong in trust in the providence of God to be able to wade through the hell that's going to break loose on us. And it will be on us before we even recognize it. Unless, unless in God's providence, He is not done. He is not done. Anyway, so you got a time of falling away. Then you got the abomination of desolation, the green part here. That's an anchor point you can count on. This is the abomination of desolation. Then we have a time of great tribulation. And then we have the sun and the moon going dark and the Son of Man coming in the clouds to gather together his elect. Now in 2 Thessalonians, Paul wrote to the church and said, Don't be confused if you got a letter that looks like it came from us because it didn't come from us. The gathering together, the coming of the Lord, cannot come until there's a falling away and the man of sin is revealed. So the rapture takes place after those two events. We'll see more on that later. We need to talk about this day of Christ, because this is critical. The day of Christ cannot come until there's a falling away and the man of sin is revealed. Here is an anchor point. Now, during this next three and a half years, it's called the time of great tribulation. Back to Matthew chapter 24, if you're reading along here. Verse number um, 20. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then, remember now, the word then means then, you know, like next, coming after that. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world. You know, the world's gone through some pretty tough times. There have been some real times of tribulation, probably. There have been guys like Hitler want to run around and kill everybody, rule the world, Stalin, Pol Pot, uh, uh, Castro. There have always been people trying to, you know, pinky in the brain kind of folks. We're going to rule the world. The, the world has gone through some real tribulation, but this is going to be great tribulation like has never happened before. You think what happened in communist China was bad when they took over and killed 60 or 100 million Christians? Yeah, that was bad. You think what happened in Nazi Germany was bad when they killed 6 million Jews and 4 or 5 million other people? Oh, yeah, that was bad. That was tribulation. Jesus said, this is going to be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world. To this time, no, nor ever shall be. Matthew 24, verse 22. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then, if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Verse 25. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he's in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he's in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth unto, even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Well, this is talking about his coming, his coming back. This is this, that what we're waiting for. Verse 28, for wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Verse 29, now read this carefully. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened 
and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. When does this happen? Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light. Well, now there's another anchor point we need to study. When does the sun and the moon go dark? Well, it tells us right here it goes dark after the tribulation. We see in Acts chapter 2 and the book of Joel that the sun and the moon go dark before the day of the Lord starts. Now, the word before means before, and after means after, and then means then. So tell folks you've got your Greek degree now. You understand what those words mean? Okay. <clears throat> um, verse 29 in the middle. And the stars from, shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. Verse 30. And then, oh, there's another, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then means next, okay, sequence. Shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So when is the Son of Man coming in the clouds? After the sun and the moon go dark, which comes after the tribulation, which comes after the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. His disciples asked him their question. He's answering it. Lord, when are you coming and what's the sign? Okay, guys, look for trouble. Look for people falling away. They're going to quit. They're going to love of many. He's going to wax cold. People are going to run off into all kinds of wicked sins. The world's going to get wicked. And Jesus said, like it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be when the Son of Man shall come. They're eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage. God is not in their thoughts. Just like it was in the days of Noah before the flood came, that's what's coming next. We're going to see unbelievable rise in sin. Every kind of sin you can imagine. Sodom and Gomorrah all over the world. And he said in verse uh, 11, and many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, the sequence is the same in every passage. You line them up and put it together for yourself. Matthew 24, 3 through 31, Mark 13, 4 through 27, Luke 21, 7 through, we got a typo there, should be 28. Randall, fix that, okay? Should be Luke 7, 21, 7 through 28. Let me mark that here. Another typo. Whew. Made it almost all year without a mistake. Oh, man. Oh, well, I'll try again next year. But the sequence is the same, folks. After the tribulation, the sun and the moon go dark. This is an anchor point. You can't miss it. The breaking of the treaty, the abomination of desolation makes it real clear. We know what comes before that. We know what comes after that. Now, what is this day of Christ? What happens in this day of Christ? Well, the day of the Lord, Roland Rasmussen has some great posters I put in the back. He gave me permission to put the back in the back of my book. He's got the day of the Lord and the day of Christ as two separate events. And they are two completely separate events. Go to 1 Corinthians in your Bible. We've got time, yep, time to start this. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 is the first mention of the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is not the day of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 7. So that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, the rapture, the second coming. Who, also, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. The first mention of the Lord of the day of Christ talks about the coming of the Lord and talks about that's the day we're confirmed to and we're made blameless. Well, that's when we're out of here. That ain't going to happen on this planet. We've got to get out of here to be made blameless. I'll take away this sinful nature. So the first mention of the day of Christ is when we are taken away the coming of the Lord, and we're confirmed and we're made blameless. Now go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Here's the second mention. 
of the day of Christ. In this chapter, the first five verses talk about a man living in adultery with his mother or stepmother in the town of Corinth. Uh, that's about as low as you can get. So he's living in adultery, and Paul says, look, turn him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Let the devil kill him. You can read the passage later. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 5. To deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Hmm. So the day of the Lord Jesus is the day we're confirmed. It's the day where that's the end of our race, and that's the day the spirit is saved. Even this guy living in a pretty bad sin, he's still going to heaven, eternal security. Now go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 1 is the third mention of the day of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 12. For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God we have had our conversation in the world, and more abundantly to you were. For we write none other things unto you than what we read or acknowledge, and I trust ye shall acknowledge even unto the end, as also ye have acknowledged us in part, that ye, that we are your rejoicing, even as ye also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. Hmm. So the day of the Lord Jesus is the day we rejoice. The race is over. It's done. We made it. It's finished. So the day of Christ is the day we're confirmed to. It's the day the Spirit is saved. It's the day we can rejoice. The race is over. The day of Christ is the day of the rapture, as we'll see. Turn now to the book of Philippians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, chapter 1. In the book of Philippians, the day of Christ is mentioned three times. So of the seven references to the day of Christ, you got three of them right here. Philippians, chapter 1, verse number 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So that, does that tell us that God is going to keep working in us until the day of Christ? Well, yeah, because that's when it's over. We're done. We're taken to heaven. The job is finished. So we don't have to make it or endure until the end, which is the day of Christ. As far as the Christians go, that's the end. We're done. So he's going to perform it until the day of Christ. Skip down to verse number 10, First, uh, Philippians 1.10 that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. That's the end of our race, folks. Now chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2. And go back and study all these passages. You'll see the day of Christ is obviously the rapture. The race is over. We're done. Uh, mm -hmm. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 16. Holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Paul said, I want you to hang on so I can rejoice that I haven't done all this work for nothing. I traveled over there, I got beat up, stoned, put in prison, shipwrecked, and I brought the gospel to you folks. And I want to rejoice in the day of Christ. I want this to be over with. That's the day of Christ. The last mention of the day of Christ. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We read this one earlier. Here's the last mention. There's one more allusion to the day of Christ, but this is the last mention of the day of Christ. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 2. That you be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, day of Christ, shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So here we have the seven references to the day of Christ. Now there are several more allusions. They don't mention the words day of Christ, but in 1 John 3, when we shall see him, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That's the rapture when we see the Lord coming back. So this day of Christ is the end of our race. It comes after the tribulation, before the wrath of God falls. 